I would like to first of all welcome everyone to the second uh, open lecture of uh, the Jakob Spiter series in 2021. Um, we have had a, an open lecture last week. We will have another one next week with Professor Chabaple. Today I will be uh, hosting uh, Professor Nadasdi from Eteslova University, a noted poet, linguist, translator, and the polyhistor, I would claim to say, uh, or dare to say, he might uh, challenge me on that uh, later. Uh, the structure of the lecture will be uh, as follows. First, in the next five minutes, I will just explain the, the whole setting of this open lecture series. Then we will have a, a sort of a, a short uh, view on the structure of this present, uh, present lecture today. And then I will uh, start with a 30 to 35 minute sort of discussion with Professor Nadashdi when we are going to cover uh, topics of his career and more importantly, topics of scholarly interest, which will be followed by a longer, say 50, 55 minutes period of questions from the audience. So I would like to ask everyone to, to note their questions, to, to take notes during the, the first part of the lecture and be prepared to, to come in in the second part and, and bring on their own questions. Uh, the point being uh, that we discuss as many topics as, as is needed uh, and uh, the whole structure, as I uh, sort of promised to, to explain, is that there is, an open, there is a, a peer review journal called Jakob Schleiter, which we started this year and this peer review journal uh, aims at uh, enabling high school students to engage with scholarly topics and paradigms and to engage with scholarly uh, discussions on a variety of topics. This year's theme is maps and models and we would like to uh, sort of initiate uh, a thinking process by uh, hosting this lecture, uh, lecture series with, a, with a, a sequence of noted scholars and we will today uh, discuss a couple of topics uh, which goes into this direction. Uh, so if we have, and I think I can see a couple of uh, high school students among the audience, if we have high school students among the audience, I would like to specifically encourage you to, to dare to speak up in the second part of this lecture and, and bring your own questions to the table. This is a chance to talk to some of the, the most noted scholars of Hungary. Uh, today, as I said, uh, this, uh, um, Honor goes to Professor Nadashti. So with this, I would like to, to sort of uh, in, introduce my, my discussion partner. Professor Nadashti, who is a professor of Ötlös Urand University, is a linguist, a philologist, a translator, and a poet. Uh, as not only a distinguished scholar himself, but a teacher of many generations of students of English language, as well as linguistics, uh, as far as I know, although I have never had the honor of, of attending one of his lectures uh, when I was a university student myself. Um, and this is, as I said, the second uh, iteration of our open lecture series. As for myself, my name is Andor Kananagi. I will be uh, hosting uh, this open lecture and I am uh, in charge of the Jakob Schleiter online journal. With this, I would like to start uh, uh, the conversation. And my first question uh, is sort of um, an introduction on, on how I got introduced to you, Professor. Uh, I think I was probably 14 or 15 when I came across uh, a, a short book uh, entitled Harum Pertesek a uh, which as far as I understood at that point uh, was an introduction into a, a variety of grammatic questions and discussions about the Hungarian language and although I do not dare to claim that I understood even half of what I read it was definitely the first step in my journey toward getting interested in, in, in languages, speaking my interest in, in, in issues of philology. And what I would like to, to ask you as a starting point is if you had any similar experiences in your, in your career, any starting point when you have been exposed to something which started, which launched you on this journey of scholarship. Yes, thank you very much. And hello, everybody. And uh, I'm pleased to be here with you. And uh, the, the audience. Yes, I, <clears throat> I had uh, Latin at school because uh, my English was quite good and uh, my German was also good because my mother was Austrian and so we were half a German speaking family. So I went to Latin and um, in the Latin book there was a long 
chapter at the end in small print, which described the relationship of Latin to Russian, which came as a surprise to me, but it was very systematically described. Today, I know that this is trivial. They are both Indo-European languages and very similar indeed. Uh, not the vocabulary so much, but the grammar. It is very, very similar. You have masculine, feminine, and neuter. You have things like the nominative and the accusative of every noun in the neuter is always the same. Uh, neuters end in a in the plural in both Latin and Russian, and so on and so forth. And um, I read this with, with genuine interest because we have had Russian, of course, I knew a little bit of Russian just as much as one had to in those times. And uh, this, this became a, a serious interest. At the same time, I knew Italian quite well because my parents were musicians and they both spoke Italian. And so during the Latin class, I often began to think about how the Latin words differed from the Italian words, how, how you could derive Italian. So, for example, the word for mountain is uh, mons in Latin and monte in Italian. But where does the T come from? I asked myself. But then if you take the accusative, it's montem in Latin and the ablative is monte and there you go. And so I discovered after a while that for some strange reason, the Italian doesn't inherit the nominative, but it inherits the accusative, or as I then thought, the ablative of the nouns. But then later I learned seriously that it's really the accusative which is inherited. Anyway, I was surrounded by languages which I partly knew and which I partly didn't know. And um, there, were, there were books or materials uh, which opened my eyes to this whole world. Oh, plus, in the second year of my grammar school, a new Russian teacher came uh, to teach us, who was a woman of Greek origin. She was Greek, and uh, she didn't know Hungarian at all, but she was a native speaker of Russian because she grew up in Russia. And as far as I can remember, she had no idea of teaching especially not teaching Russian as a foreign language. Maybe she was a teacher of Russian herself, but only to, to, to children whose mother tongue was Russian. That's a different job. And so she had absolutely no idea why we made mistakes and how she should have explained things to us and why we knew so little, of course, by the time she thought we would know much more. She struggled, but her accent was just beautiful. I had never heard authentic, beautiful Russian speech. And so I was sitting there, bored to death, mind you, by her stupid teaching, excuse me, but at the same time interested in the way she spoke. And I started taking notes about devoicing of certain consonants in certain positions, and palatalizations, and hard and soft, and um, all that, and the schwas, and so on. That, by that time, I, I was in my second or third year in the, the grammar school, and um, yes, it was uh, quite interesting. I, I drew up a model of how her speech could be generated, I didn't know the word then, but I do now, I did, if you like, a very, a very simple generating machine on paper, which would map out the way her speech could be derived from the spelt form of the Russian word. So that there was a word for milk in Russian, moloko is the spelling. But the way she said it was molako. And she had three different pronunciations for the O, the O, and the O. And then I started sort of uh, looking for other examples. I think I even, I even trapped her asking some stupid question so that she would pronounce a particular word that I was after. I know that this is called elicitation. You know, I used her as a native informant, and I would elicit 
uh, things. She was a bit surprised why I would suddenly come up with milk in the middle of a class, which was about, I don't know, the Second World War or something. But anyway, yes, I, 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 I did serious work. Right, so it, it, it seems to me that, that what was of peculiar importance to you uh, was, was this exposure to foreign languages. And I think this begs the, the next question that I, that, I would, that I would pose in this regard. To me, it seems historically somewhat surprising that you took up English uh, at that point. Uh, and if you could uh, elucidate on, on why you, you chose that language at such a young age, well, English is like any other language. What's the matter with English? I mean, why why should you ask? I, I, I don't, there is no matter with English. It's just uh, in my in my historical understanding, uh, at that time there would have been there would have been German, which would be uh, which would be also fitting in your family environment, as far as I understand. You already spoke German. Uh, you could have uh, taken up French. You could have taken up Russian, as you later did. But my under, in my understanding, you already spoke English by that time, right? So you started rather young. Yes, yes, yes. That, that was for romantic interest because English was the language that nobody spoke in my environment. And it was somehow sort of challenging, you know, to, so that, yes, I mean, because we were three brothers. We all had to have French because we were a middle class family. And so everybody knew French better than I. I was the youngest of the brothers. And um, well, of course, German everybody knew, and Italian also. My parents knew Italian because uh, they were musicians. And um, so that, that wasn't challenging. I didn't want to take up German. German sounded like, like home, like my grandparents. There was something embarrassing about German. The other, the children would laugh at me because they heard I was talking German to my grandfather. We had a dog, for example, and we, we would walk the dog together. And then sometimes the, the children in the street would see me and start shouting in German, Wo ist der Hund? They would shout, where is the dog? Because they knew that much, everybody knew that much German in, in those times. And I sort of wanted to get away from it. So I practically, how should I say, I concealed my knowledge of German for a long time because yeah, it, it, it didn't work. And um, yes, uh, English. And so as a young boy, I started uh, taking English classes and that was somehow exciting and nobody in the family spoke English. Um, actually, the people would ask me, like you did now, people would ask me, why are you studying English? <laughs> Today, this question would not be sort of justified anymore. It, it sounded like, you know, you found somebody who is studying Lithuanian and you would ask, why are you studying Lithuanian? Do you have anybody there or are you planning to visit Lithuania or why? Well, that's exactly what people ask. And I just shrugged and I said, well, it's interesting. And then suddenly, when I was about 15, the pop music explosion came from England. And suddenly it all made sense that I could understand what the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were singing about. And, uh, okay, not, not a whiter shade of pale, that still I don't understand, but I was reassured to find that the text does not make sense Really, you know, yes, they skip the light fandango as the miller told his tale and so on. Okay. All right, so, so the way you present it now, it seems like it's sort of arbitrary that you ended up becoming a, a noted scholar of English philology. But yet there was a point of decision, right? You, you decided uh, when you got to, got to the age of, of going to university that you would embark on English literature and Italian. Yes. So, yes. Yes. what was the it, what was the reasoning then? I Italian, I knew well because I often went to Italy, and uh, one needed a second subject, so I added Italian because well, it, why not? Um, and uh, English was was my 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 real interest, if you like, 
because I always wanted to be a linguist. I was always more interested in the formal side than in the cultural or literary side. It is interesting, of course, that after so many years, I ended up as uh, translating works of literature in English, plays by Bernard Shaw and Shakespeare, and uh, Dante's Divine Comedy in Italian. But both of these branches of my activities are about texts pretty old by current standards. Even, even Bernard Shaw is more than 100 years old, or 100 years old now. And so my training as a linguist comes in very handy in, in treating these texts. Anyway, um, <clears throat> yes, English, and I taught English as a foreign language with great uh, energy and uh, elan, and uh, I, I, I liked it and wrote various textbooks or, or took part in projects, writing textbooks and so on. Many of those who, who go to, to study languages at university have a very clear plan of, of becoming teachers later on or, or some sort of financial consideration behind knowing a foreign language which would give them a good career prospect. Uh, and as far as I, I know, you also started uh, after, right after university, um, started to teach at a high school. Uh, uh, but then later on, uh, you decided, uh, or it's, it turned out so that you ended up being an academic uh, and and what my question is if there was a point a specific point that you can that you can sort of uh, clearly state where you decided to become a scholar uh, and to and to stay on in this university career pathway there was a conference at beach when i was a young grammar school teacher and it was about English and Hungarian. The two languages contrasted, the two grammars uh, put side by side. And I remember I gave a paper, put hard work into it, which came from my teaching experience about relative pronouns. Um, what and which and that and zero you know, the book I'm reading, the book which I'm reading, but never the book what I'm reading, which is a typical Hungarian mistake, but why is it a Hungarian mistake, and so on. And that was well received. That, that I, I got a surprising amount of discussion there, and people, adults, people much older than myself, already in, in, in the business, came up to me and said how interesting it was and so on. And um, that, that is probably where a, an older colleague from uh, Utve Schlorand University, Mrs. Stefanides, who used to be my teacher earlier and who knew that I existed, she must have realized then that this young man has an interest for the formal side of language for analysis and so on and then a year or two later somebody went abroad or fell ill or i don't remember or maybe became pregnant and so um, a substitute had to be found and so they contacted me if i wanted to do that and i uh, and i did yes and so i continued then with this line of research and did you have a, a mentor figure uh, as a young a scholar? Did you have someone that was... Uh, you're gone, sorry. Not enough, I have to tell you, not enough. Uh, the, both of the departments where I, I got my, 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 my instruction, that is to say the English department and the Italian department, were very much literature oriented. Um, there was very good teaching methodology and coaching and mentoring. I, 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 I used that, but that wasn't linguistics. Okay, the teachers who taught linguistics were decent and they knew their job and their English was excellent, which at that time was a big thing. Not everybody's English was very good and it wasn't even, it wasn't even a requirement that you should speak 
the, the target language so well. It was a bit like in the classics department, you know, where it would have been ridiculous to require that you should speak Latin or classical Greek fluently. Why? I mean, it would have been a, 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 a stunt, really. So anyway, back to uh, linguistics. No, there was, uh, uh, the, as much as there was, was a, a man called Professor Hutterer. And Hutterer was a professor of Germanic. Um, that is to say, the prehistory of English and German and Gothic and Dutch and Scandinavian and so on. And he gave lectures on, on that subject, which first, I have to tell you, was a bit strange to me. But then I connected it to this Latin Russian thing and it fell into place. And uh, it was Hutterer who then later also included Yiddish into his, his realm, which is a, a variety of German, linguistically speaking. Culturally, it's very different being spoken by Jews in Eastern Europe and uh, elsewhere in the world. But linguistically, it's an interesting dialect or variety of German, uh, as you can say. Uh, Hutter included this into his um, curriculum, and uh, that's well, that's how I I got acquainted with this uh, language. And uh, anyway, but by the time I finished my studies, I suddenly realized that I really needed a master, and that was Zygmunt Telegdi, the professor of general linguistics and of Iranian studies. Iranian, basically meaning Persian, okay. And I went to, up to him and I said, Professor, I would like to study with you. And he became a bit embarrassed and said, well, what, what, what can I do for you? And he, so in the end, um, it turned out that the best idea would be if I took up the course in Iranian. And so I, I studied with him for four or five years, and that's really where I became a linguist, because I could go with him into his workshop, so to speak, okay? Iranian was a small uh, branch, there were few students, you could, you could always talk to teachers and professors and so on, and um, that, that's really where I uh, took my training. I, at the beginning of this, of this uh, conversation, I, I sort of dared to claim that I consider you a polyhistor. Uh, and I, I think, I think, sorry, go on. I don't know anything about chemistry or physics or, come on, I mean. Well, probably, can't. probably, but you just, I, I think you just proven, uh, you just proved my point beautifully by, by just listing the, the, the incredible range of languages with which you are familiar the incredible range of cultural environments in which you feel comfortable. And what I would like to ask about this specifically, with regards, perhaps in a more general way, with regards to scholarship, is do you think it is an advantage to be well-versed in different sciences, or do you sometimes feel, or could, do, do you have any experience that would indicate that this sort of fragmentization actually decreases from one's capability of engaging with his or her subject matter? This is a valid question. I can't shrug it off. It also depends on, how should I say? <laughs> it depends on your digestive system. You know, some people prefer to eat the same kind of food all the time. Others need a bit of sweet, a bit of sour, and so on. I feel better if I do various things, but you may be right, that doesn't take you very far into one particular depth. Don't forget that I may be a professor, and you may describe me as a polyhistor, which is a, an exaggeration, but I haven't become a member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, which otherwise would have been a, a nice sort of um, goal or, or end or objective of a career like mine and some of my colleagues have, and uh, deservedly so, and I haven't, because I switch from one thing to the other. 
um, I don't I don't specialize enough. Maybe I'm maybe I'm not patient enough. You know, maybe yes, maybe I get impatient after a while. I I don't know. So I wouldn't recommend. Uh, but then on the other hand, if if somebody is like me, then maybe it's not good to be chained to your bench and 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 drudge away with things that that don't interest you enough sorry about that yes absolutely i mean i i fully agree with you i i am personally i'm also interested in multiple things and i could never be changed down uh, but perhaps moving on to to towards an even more general way in our way into to more scholarly questions now uh, just as a, as a as an ending point i would like to ask uh, what you would say is the is the good as a marker of a, of a good scholar so how would you describe if you had to describe a good scholar in one sentence what defines a good scholar you are using the word scholar and not scientist uh, does that mean that, that you are talking about somebody in the humanities not necessarily um, but i wanted to make this distinction yes ah, because I know less about how to become a good chemist or, or physicist or mathematician or geologist or whatever. In the humanities, I think that in order to be a good scholar, you do need a large amount of lexical information. It is important. It is important to know if you're a historian, for example, I think to be a good historian, you have to know a huge amount of data by heart. And if I ask you, when did Charlemagne die? Then you have to be able to know that. Was it 812? I think it was 814. Yeah. Ah, there you go, you see, yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> The same in languages, okay, you can analyze, of course, one language and you can go, go to very good data, but it's always very good if you know that, ah, in, in, in Hindi you have a similar phenomenon and in Arabic uh, this is pronounced blah blah and whatever. That is to say, a huge amount of data and data are beautiful, data are exciting. And in, in scholarship, you always, I mean, in, in the humanities, you, you always have a bigger need for the, or literature for that matter. And you have to read a lot of books in order to become a literary scholar, in order to analyze one book or one writer properly. Um, in the humanities, it's also important to know what earlier generations said about the same thing. Whereas this is not the case in um, physics or chemistry or astronomy and so on. It, it, it is probably interesting, but it's a different subject. In other words, in a science faculty, you always have a subsidiary subject called history of. Okay, so I suppose in the physics course, you have a subject, a minor subsidiary subject called history of physics. But this would be ridiculous in, in the humanities courses to have a subsidiary subject history of whatever, because that's really the thing itself. So I say go into the humanities if you like data if you're a like if you're like a gardener who looks around and knows the names of many trees and so on even if you then sit down in front of your microscope and look at a cell where it doesn't matter any longer whether it is wheat or rye because you're not, after all, such such um, superficial uh, phenomena like being wheat or rye, but what you want is the living cell. With this, I would, I would like to move on to, to one of the core topics uh, for today, uh, namely the English language. And I would like to start with a, with a seemingly very stupid, or perhaps actually very stupid question, 
Uh, do you think that English language, learning English, is more difficult than learning other languages? No. No. Difficult is not a word which linguistics uses at all. We, we don't use this word. It would be like saying in biology, you know, do you think to be a snake is more difficult than to be a lizard? Well, I don't know. We, we don't do that. I mean, the snakes don't say this and the lizards don't say it either. Um, children, uh, how should I say, acquiring their mother tongue show no difference, okay? All languages are acquired by native speaker children at the same rate. With, with differences, of course, but they don't depend on the language, they depend on the person. Um, for a Chinese, for example, Hungarian or Czech or Italian are equally difficult. The vocabulary exotic, okay? Now, for a Hungarian, it, Italian might be easier because you have words like, uh, Teatro, the theater, problema, the, the problem, and um, bellissimo, very beautiful, and so on. But if you're Chinese, then teatro, bellissimo, don't help you at all. In other words, in, in lay parlance, easy and difficult often means when you compare two languages, how close is the vocabulary, how close is the grammar, well, of course, then it matters a lot, but that's not, that's for adults, or anyway, for mature speakers who already have a mother tongue. Yes, and in, in that case, I don't know if English is easier for Hungarians than German. I don't know. We, we never, excuse me, we never had such experiences with colleagues in the German department and students taking their final exam were not better in English or in German or the other way around. No. The reason I, I brought this up, no. uh, argue, uh, admittedly in a very provocative manner, is that the opposite is something that I often hear when I talk to students who claim that, oh yeah, English is an easy language to acquire. It didn't take me much and much time. And now I'm turning toward more difficult ones. And so what I'm wondering perhaps is, why is this perception around, especially nowadays, that English is something easier to acquire? And does it say anything about the nature of the English language that we, for example, here speak? Uh, and this is, I would say, markedly different from, from the nature of the English language that, uh, that two uh, inhabitants of London would use in a conversation similar to ours. This is, a, this is really a question about social psychology, not about linguistics, okay? Um, it's also the way these languages are taught. English has little morphology. You know what morphology is? That is to say the, the various endings that the words can take on. And people often think that the less morphology there is, the easier the language will be. Now, that's not true, um, and English is actually very tricky because it has little morphology, but the syntax, of course, is much more difficult. Um, you may not even realize that you're making mistakes, whereas with the morphology, the mistakes become very obvious. Okay, say you're learning Hungarian, whether it is bon or ben, whether it is knock or tool, whether it is all of our shot or all of our stum, various endings, you, you can spot the mistakes there. I have to tell you that I have friends who are of foreign background, say English or German, and who have learned Hungarian quite well. This is no problem for them. They never mistake Bon and Ben and all of our shot and all of our stum and so on. What they do have mistakes in, where Hungarian is killingly difficult is the verbal prefixes. Um, um, a friend wrote to me the other day in Hungarian, you, you, most of you speak Hungarian, you will understand. 
úgyhogy fordítottam. You can't say that, you have to say lefordítottam. And can you see, otherwise everything is perfect in his sentence. The endings are okay, the, the word order is okay, the verbal prefix is English, for instance. In English, for instance, you have the tenses, which are very, very difficult, much more difficult than, than in German or French. The difference between I read the book and I have read the book is something that you will go on having problems with till the end of the end of your life. I have to start, I know English very well, I taught all my life, I'm an old professor. And I have to hesitate sometimes. Is this I read the book or I have read the book? I never hesitate in German about this or Italian or French. Um, another thing in English, just little things like you can say in English, I am certain that he will come. You can also say, I am sure that he will come. The meaning is the same. You can say, it is certain that he will come. But you can't say, it is sure that he will come. Why not? Well, because sure belongs to that category of words, which you can't put into this syntactic position. OK, English doesn't have a morphology or very little of it, but it has syntactic rules, and it has the syntactic rules are just as, as subtle as those of Hungarian. You can say, he told me to go home, but you can't say, he suggested me to go home. Okay, now those people, Andor, who tell you that English is easy, I'm afraid they are not aware of these things, and they innocently and happily rush in where angels fear to tread okay and of course they are understood but then sorry being understood is not what we are talking about okay being understood is easy in all languages i think i think that beautifully brings me to to my to my next question which is again going to be a very provocative one i have been following quite arduously your your public uh, your public uh, intellectual career and your uh, discussions with fellow linguists and and uh, scholars of other of other fields uh, about the nature of language and the nature of grammar and my understanding but correct me if i'm mistaken is that you argue heavily against uh, the notion of correct and incorrect language uh, as a linguist, and yet uh, just now you have been using terms such as error, mistake, rules, laws of language. So I'm curious, how could you harmonize these two positions? It's not me who says this. I mean, the, any language, any linguistics textbook will tell you this from Vancouver to Vladivostok. This, this is linguistics, okay? Um, what the, the layman thinks about correctness is, is, is property or, or elegant language use, but that is always when you have a choice. In English, for example, you can choose between I don't know anything or I don't know nothing. Okay, some people use this. Some people use the other. That's all the linguist can say. The fact that these groups of people both hate each other and consider that they do the wrong thing and that one group says that the others are uneducated bumpkins and the other says that they're all snobs and, and uh, you know, I mean, this is very, very interesting, but that's sociology. That's very similar to whether you have a garden or you don't, what kind of dog you, you, you keep, and other things. Clothing and so on. Is, do you understand what I mean? That's not, the linguist has nothing to say about that. These are, how should I say, this is etiquette. As such, it is very important, but it has no linguistic background. The linguist can't decide because there are languages which have I don't know nothing, like Hungarian, nem tudok semmit. Okay, this is called negative concord. 
Hungarian, I think. There are languages which are like English. I don't know anything or I know nothing. Anyway, German is like this. Ich weiß nicht. Uh, okay, well, that's interesting. But, you know, some animals have legs, others don't. That's all we can say. Um, when, I, when we use correct, that means would a native speaker say this? I don't know nothing is correct, of course, in that variety of English. Okay, that's all. If somebody said, I don't nothing know, aha, that's incorrect. That's incorrect because that sounds like a Dutch uh, sailor trying to speak uh, substandard English. Okay, that's a different thing. This, this brings me, and this is probably what going to be my last question, uh, and then I would, I would turn to the audience and ask them to, to bring their questions on, but this just one, one more thing that, that bothers me here, uh, namely that, that you have been giving, Justin, as this last point, you have been bringing an example of, of languages influencing each other, and we can see that in many languages. You have been talking about this at the very beginning of this conversation, how how Latin and, and, it, uh, and Italian are obviously related, how French and Italian and so on and so forth. Often languages of different linguistic families influence each other. And my question is, uh, with a very, very shady understanding of the history of English, uh, as little as I know is that it has a huge Latin, it has, it has some Greek and it has a huge French element in it and some Anglo-Saxon element in it. So, how long can we call English English if it is heavily influenced by other languages? How long can we call French French if it is heavily influenced by German? And the list should go on and on. This partly depends on what the speakers themselves call it. Okay, so yeah, if they call it English, well, let them have it. Um, what really matters to us is the machinery. How can I say? Imagine like a train, a freight train made up of lorry cars and you can change the cargo that is carried by the train, but the wheels and the cars and the mechanism is the same. Now English is obviously a Germanic language because the article is the and not le ou la, as in French. The adjective is before the noun, white dog, and not after it, chien blanc, as in French. You never say, look, there's a dog white running in the street. Uh-uh, that's Germanic, to say white dog, okay? You, you just said a sentence, that's interesting. Um, you said, how long can we call English English? All these words are Anglo-Saxon. How long can we call English English? If it is, and now comes the first French word, influenced. Okay, and then back by another language. Now that's again, interestingly, a foreign word, English, has very, very many loan words in its vocabulary, but the grammar is hardly influenced at all. A, a few influences may be detected, like the of genitive, so that we say um, the roof of the house today rather than the house's roof. That may be a French influence. Okay, le toit de la maison. But otherwise very, very little. For example, you have in French a kind of past tense with have, okay? J'ai chanté. And word by word this translates as I have sung, but that's not what it is because it is I sang, actually j'ai chanté. So even if on the surface it seems to be similar, you have to be careful. No. So we say that it is the structure which matters and not the vocabulary. And this is called the structural principle. And it is more important for us linguists. Culturally speaking, the vocabulary can be very interesting. Take Hungarian again, which 
structurally is obviously one of the Uralic languages or Finno Ugric. Uh, well, it's a branch of Uralic. Whereas the vocabulary, very, very large amount of the vocabulary is borrowed from old Turkish, from Slav, from German, from Latin, from Italian, from English, you name it. Okay, but the structure is Uralic. Thank you. At this point, I would like to invite members of the audience to unmute themselves and ask their questions so that we can turn this into a discussion uh, of, of multiple parties and not just two. Don't, don't feel timid. Uh, this is precisely the, the, the venue and the time to ask your questions. And I'm sure that there are multiple questions out there. Uh, so please, yeah. Um, so my question to Professor Nadoshdi would be about translation. You said at the beginning of the conversation that that was a, one of the branches that stemmed from you being a linguist. Um, and my question would be why you particularly chose those texts to translate and not others? Let me answer this way. Why I, why I do older stuff is because I'm not afraid of older stuff because of my studies of lang linguistics, including historical linguistics, makes it a bit more accessible for me. Also, it means that I'm less at home with contemporary stuff. I wouldn't try to translate a contemporary play because I'm not so much at home in it that's that's not my field as it were now we say take the shakespeare plays or the bernard shaw plays or the oscar wilde which play i did depended on on the commission it depended on the theater it is always the theaters that wanted it but they know that i can be um, charged with the, doing old stuff and that's that i would do it and i'm not afraid of the footnotes in the in the critical editions i'm not afraid of the small print you remember my russian latin textbook which had small print in it that's why really also because uh, i maybe i speak german well and i always use german translations to check on my hungarian translations to see what the german colleague did how how they translate Thank you. Thank you. Feel free to, to, to unmute yourselves. Uh, I'm sure there are questions. Thank you. May, may I uh, just pop in to um, say that I'm from that generation when uh, we had to study German. So uh, I remember that when I was a small child, I started with German and later on at the university, I got English and uh, we met there with Adam at that time. And uh, when I would like to add to it uh, the question of difficulty, uh, how difficult the language is and comparing German and English, I had an old teacher when I was a kid. And he gave me a very good explanation for that. What was the difference between German and English? And he compared it to a forest. And he said, when you start studying German, you walk into a very deep forest. It's dark and frightening. And you get slowly out of the forest and then it gets lighter and you're smiling you find the sunshine and it's easier now it's just the opposite with english you get into an easy walk into a very nice little forest and as you get deeper into it it gets darker and darker 
and darker and you feel you will never get out of it. And mm -hmm. I found it a very good explanation to the difference between the two. Yes, thank you very much. You're right, because you don't realize at the beginning how much problems we will have between I work and I'm working Mm. and I have worked and I have been working and, and so on and so forth, you're right. Or even uh, with, with things like uh, in Amsterdam I overheard a conversation from another table where an Italian tourist um, was talking to a Dutch guy and the Dutch guy said to him, she wanted to make conversation. They were probably waiting for someone and they were just making small talk. And the Dutch guy said, well, what brings you to Amsterdam? And the Italian said, well, my camera. Because he misunderstood the sentence, of course, in the sense that what is it that you bring with yourself? to Amsterdam. In other words, um, what do you bring to Amsterdam? And the, 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 he spoke English, you know, otherwise they made conversation, but he totally misunderstood the sentence, what brings you to Amsterdam? And he was a bit surprised, what a stupid question. And so he had his camera with him and said, well, my camera. Maybe he was a photographer. And then I said to myself, ah, there you go. This is exactly what you said, the forest becoming darker and darker without the poor Italian guy realizing where he is. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, I must add to it that at that time I didn't understand because I was, I was, I was starting with German. So I said, okay, I can speak German and I found that perhaps English might be, might be more difficult, but I didn't find that after all, but they, they coexisted, the two languages coexisted in my mind, which made it difficult. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, <laughs> I would like to connect to uh, uh, the question Ander was asking about what makes um, a good scholar. Now, at Milestone, we obviously work with secondary school students and uh, we work hard on their orientation to ensure that they find something that they feel passionate about and, you know, that's going to help them become successful and happy people in their lives. And um, oversimplifying it maybe a little bit, but the main avenues one can take after graduating from university is academia, public sector, private sector, like I say, with some oversimplification. And um, some of us obviously stay in academia, and I think I know a lot of people, including myself, who leave academia and then kind of from time to time sort of regret that or, or just feel that longing, you know, <laughs> uh, towards academia, academia. So I was just wondering, what would you say uh, may help students or what what is it in themselves that they should look for um, to know that academia is the field that they should you know that they should stay in I suppose a, a certain childish abandonment to to a problem where where you know, they don't notice that they put on different socks in the morning uh, because they're still thinking about the problem. Um, that is certainly true. That there's a certain amount of loneliness also in academia, which doesn't fit everybody. You know, some people like to be in a group, in a team, in a classroom, surrounded by 20 children or, or, or students. Or, or in an office, um, that kind of thing. But the, the academic thing is basically a lonely one, especially in the humanities, well, yeah, for mathematics even, I suppose. There's not much to, to do teamwork there. Um, so whether they can, uh, you know, sort of daydream for a while uh, about a problem, I think that, that is important or interesting. I know some people who earn 
they are living as uh, in, in the public sector or in the private sector, but at the same time, they write articles and go to conferences on one particular thing that they can manage, or people who teach in schools. Um, I don't know about the sciences, I'm sure that, that they exist there as well, but in history or in uh, literature, I know that some school teachers uh, also have a, a hand in in academic life, but it's it's basically, I think, to ask yourself whether you can spend a morning or a night alone thinking about something. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to to sort of sort of push on the conversation with a question from my side just to just to perhaps introduce a couple of other directions here dolma asked you about translations and and one thing that i'm uh, always interested in when it comes to translations and you have yourself translated from multiple languages in a variety of of, of genres um, one thing that that is always a question for me and i would like to hear your view on that is when one translates from one language to another even if it if it is i mean even if you concern, consider only uh, the translation of a sentence in a, in a speech one has to consider different uh, different factors style vocabulary grammar syntax and so on and so forth so when you are working on a translation uh, do you do you see a clear priority of these factors in the original that you have to reproduce in a certain sequence in the translated version that's hard to tell <laughs> it's a bit like cooking you know you you open the lid you smell and you say a bit of pepper and put the lid back again don't forget, I do I do literary translation, not technical translation. That's a different thing. It has to be A has to be A and B has to be B. But I do, especially for the stage, where in a matter of seconds the same effect has to be achieved, funny or tragic. But the the most important thing is faithfulness you have to write the same as in the original. Of course you can't, but now then you begin to say, all right, you can only deviate as much as absolutely necessary. Okay, how necessary is absolutely necessary is the next problem, and that's when the, the cooking metaphor comes in. Okay, only put in as much pepper as necessary. That's all I can say, but yes, the, the basic idea is to write the same and I often find in other people's translations elements where I say hey why did you write something different from what is in the original why did you write Thursday if the original has Wednesday that that well not not at, not at this level of course but um, very often you will find uh, differences that to me are unexplainable and unpardonable in other words, okay, so every deviation has to be explained in some way. Thank you. I see many of the, or some of the students uh, uh, of Maestron here, I would very much encourage you to, to speak up and, and bring your questions. I'm, I'm sure you have some. While you're gathering your thoughts, perhaps some other members of the audience have questions. Please come forward. So, um, I again, I have a question. This time it's related to the journal um, that, uh, that we will be uh, launching. And uh, sort of in the description to the students or to the, uh, yeah, to the audience of the journal in the call for papers, um, we talk about that moment when the right idea just clicks into place and suddenly it all makes sense. I was just wondering if whether in your translation, um, you know, in your work in translation or in your linguistics work or whatever, 
do you remember any such moments when you know it was just something that you had been working on and suddenly this light just came on or are there any moments that you can remember that were like that yes of course uh, in uh, linguistic analysis it's it's yeah, it's hard to it's hard to recall the moment of course and often it 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 comes from discussion with other colleagues uh, it's what we call the in hungarian when you have two words meeting and you have three consonants clashing together one from one word and two from the other or the other way around they behave differently this is what we call the partitkar problem okay this word means party secretary it's a compound and partitkar is normally pronounced with one t even though they come from with two t okay but if the first word has the consonant and the and the second and if the, the third consonant is in the first word then you can drop it but not the mirror image so you have hot droger for example can you see that's the mirror image and you can't say hot droger um, and I definitely remember we were sitting in a train going to Seged for a conference with linguist colleagues and well someone came up with this problem uh, did we ever notice and so on and uh, it, we, we found out that, that this is really a rule in Hungarian pronunciation which nobody had thought of uh, previously. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Perhaps something that also relates to to the grander image here, or the, the yeah the grander image here. Uh, the theme of of, of this year's Jakob Slider is maps and models, and and what I keep wondering about uh, throughout our our whole conversation is is that the world is full of patterns. Uh, and 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 often the, the task of the scholar or or of the simple human being who thinks is to is to describe not 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 to describe but to recognize and perhaps um, it is the job of the scholar to to describe these patterns and and I'm I'm wondering how specifically your fields your your interest in linguistics your your interest in language history can help you describing the patterns in the world, whether they are of, of a linguistic nature or something else? Very often we draw flow charts to map the, 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 the way languages have changed. And it is important, for instance, to realize that that's not my discovery, but uh, one from the middle of the 20th century that if you have a language change in which two sounds merge into one they will continue as one in the future and if they split into two i will explain everything if they split into two the split will never mirror the original merger and this is called the markov process it comes from mathematics or logic i, I that's all i know about this or it's a um, let me give you an example i take the english words meet m w -E t and meet equally pronounced m e a t these used to be different in the Middle Ages. The poet Geoffrey Chaucer obviously pronounced them differently because he never rhymes such words with each other. Now, 
around Shakespeare's life or a bit later, these two sounds. So one would in, in Chaucer's life, the the meaning to encounter would have been pronounced mate, and the other, the flesh, would have been pronounced mat. Mate and mat. Okay, two different sounds. By Shakespeare's time, to encounter would have become meat, and the other would have become mate. That's how the Irish still pronounce it. Okay, that's classical Irish English. A cup of tea, they would say. Okay, for British English, a cup of tea. Okay. And then comes what is called the meat meat merger. That is to say, these two, which have been traveling uh, the same, suddenly become one and they go on with meat meat and now it's just a matter of spelling that they are spelled in a different way okay like hungarian you know hoyo and foyo they have the same y in the middle but one is spelled with a j the other is spelled with ly because a long time ago they used to be pronounced good now however you have the same type of word in let's take um uh, beer the drink and clear meaning um uh, light okay or, or, or washed these also were the same in Chaucer's time okay clear and clear bear and bear whatever today they are pronounced differently if there's a r after them, so that I have meat, but beer, can you hear the difference? And my pronunciation is old fashioned, I'm old. But if I was young, I would pronounce meat and beer for the drink, okay? Pint of beer. And the other one would be exactly the same. That is to say, the split today depends on what comes after them whether there's a r or not but it equally affects words with a double e and an ea in them okay so once they merged meet meet now they can split but the split will depend on the following sound and never on the original uh, pair, that is to say, it's not retrievable. Language change has no memory. That's a very important thing to notice. Okay, that's what is called, okay, a finite state stochastic model or a Markov chain or whatever. Um, this, is, this is something where you can actually map on paper what is happening and we do. We do. We have to draw lines and show how it works. Thank you. Thank you. And so just to follow up on this, what are the limitations of, of trying to model things? Because I, I would imagine that they are sometimes misleading. Hmm. You have, yeah, your, your models are normally bi-dimensional. Okay, whereas language change may be tridimensional, and that's sometimes not easy to illustrate, um, that you have three factors working at the same time. Yes, 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 sometimes we use... Do you remember when I went to school, the, the kids in the other class, they had um, geometry, and uh, we didn't because we had Latin. And they had geometry, and they had a book in which there were very complicated diagrams printed in colors, green and red. And they had glasses, spectacles made of paper, and one eye was green and the other eye was red. And they would squint with one eye, and then they would see one half of the diagram, and then they would squint with the other eye and see the other half of the diagram. Can you follow what I mean? 
and we would in envy them, of course, because this book was so beautiful and we didn't have it. And so in the intervals, we would ask them to, to allow us to wear the glasses and we would squint one and the other eye. Right? But of course, um, we didn't know what it was about. But anyway, and they then told us that this is multidimensional uh, diagram. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for a couple of more questions, so I would like to encourage the audience to, to grab this opportunity, this unique opportunity of being able to talk to Professor Nadersti. Related to this last uh, topic of models and you know their limitations, um, one thing I, I have a very vivid memory of when I was in my first couple of years at university at ELTA incidentally um, and I was doing my introduction to linguistics and then syntax and all of these subjects so I remember having these conversations with uh, friends from a very different uh, field mathematics and IT and whatever and my going on to them about how great it is that in linguistic analysis essentially and again this is oversimplifying once again but what you are trying to do is to sort of come up with a system that in the descriptive rather than a prescriptive way sort of explains or produces models um, that explain why a given form is acceptable um, by native speakers or non-native speakers that's a whole different matter which is you know one that we would mark with a question mark because some speakers would say okay some people are not and which one would be marked with an asterisk and you know how you can <clears throat> sort of develop models um, to explain what's okay and what's not okay. So to include all the good options or acceptable options and exclude at the same time acceptable options. And, you know, there are numerous challenges to this, like you said about the dimensions, that language changes over time and, you know, all of that. And as I was talking about these challenges, I got the question like, so why bother? Like, you know, we use language anyway. Um, we acquire it, you know, I don't need to sort of go into linguistic analysis to speak my language or indeed to learn another one. Um, and it seems like a, a mission impossible anyway, <laughs> because it, these things that you have described. What would your response be to such a, and I'm playing devil's advocate here, obviously, but what would be your response to, to, to such a notion? It's, it's, it's not easy, really, to give a good answer. Maybe I would just say, um, um, it is the gift of God that we have intelligence, and it is in a way his imperative that we should try to find out the secrets of his creation. Do you like this answer? I think that is, that's a good answer and uh, it, it's valid as well. And so once he created us to be thinking animals and it's our duty to go after his, uh, his secrets. Uh, you know, it's very poetic if you like, very traditional, but it's true. I mean, it, it, we have to describe it because it's there. Mm -hmm. I go to the Galapagos Islands and describe the, 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 those animals there well, because they are there and because <laughs> God created them. And so we have to describe them. Well, this is pretty much a good response to all scientific analysis, really, yes. isn't it? <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Yes. Of course, then, of course, you might say there's a number of applications and, uh, of course, like um, foreign language teaching, like um, artificial intelligence, like machine translation, um, curing uh, aphasia when somebody has brain damage and they, they lose uh, part of their speech. Or if you can't cure it, you can help to diagnose what happens, you know, because often the the doctor doesn't realize clearly because the, 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 the machines, the CT and the MRI don't show anything and it is the linguist which will tell the doctor what the matter is because we know how language loss works. Um, mm -hmm. Understanding old manuscripts, forgotten languages, da da da. Um, providing an orthography to people who speak a language without having a, a literacy behind it and so on. Okay, that's all very nice. It's a bit like observing the human body. You know, your friend might 
your friends might have said, well, well why analyze my, my system? I'm healthy, I work anyway, so why do you have to go into all that? There, of course, it is much obvious what the applications are. But don't forget that often early doctors did, did not so much do it in order to cure people, yes, but also out of curiosity. You know, how, how does it work? What happens? In terms of the practical applications, you said what I came back with at the time was uh, exactly the, the sort of the medical uh, area of it and foreign language teaching because I ended up on an applied linguistics uh, sort of pathway. Um, but what you said about um, artificial intelligence, I think, you know, I kind of wish I had had that in my pocket sort of uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, because uh, I think there will be a tremendous you know, uh, scope for, for linguistic analysis in that field. I mean, if, even if we just look at how in language testing even, um, you know, they are now thinking, uh, Cambridge Assessment, for example, is saying that we are not far, like pretty much three, four years from now, that not only will um, samples of one's language use in the format of a language exam will be analyzed by, you know, by AI, but even the questions will be produced and the text to be used for it will be produced you know, using um, using AI and uh, and all the data from linguistic analysis. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you very much again. The translations provided by a simple desktop machine like mine are frighteningly good, and becoming better and better. And sometimes I I sometimes think there's a little man sitting there and giving me the answer, but obviously it's the machine. So do you think it can happen that at one point, because of AI being so great at linguistics and looking at data and obviously having the capacity to analyze um, past language data as well, way beyond uh, the capacity of uh, any certain human individual or group of researchers or whatever, do you think there may be a point in the future where AI makes us redundant <laughs> in this field? No. No, but I, I don't know. Yes, yes. I don't know. It's, it's nice to be talking and writing and so on. So I don't know. It's a bit like it's nice to be walking. Obviously, maybe a hundred years ago, people thought that everything will be so electric and machine wise that we will never take steps anywhere and we will always be sort of driving along like like sick old people do today you know sitting in their electric chairs but you don't find this people find it quite normal to to walk around so maybe that that will happen with language as well i i don't know thank you I see that there is a question in the audience. Feel free to, to speak up, Palint. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, I do not want to uh, diverge too much, but I must know this, that <clears throat> as far as I know, uh, every uh, experiment with doing translation by rules failed miserably. So I, I want to say that AI do not speak any language. AI do only statistics. It takes uh, text from this language and that language and, and compares them. So I, I think that at this moment, we don't have to fear about uh, AI outsmarting us because it's not smart. It's just very, very fast in, uh, in quotes, reading text. So it, it, if we want to feed it with rules, it never works. It cannot understand rules in the in the sense we human linguists can understand the rules it just does very simple i i must say simple statistical comparison of of uh, sentences and and such things thank you very much indeed this is what i understand also that um, yes the the machine is very very diligent and very fast and has access to a large number of uh, data and database um, and this is not what um, the linguist is interested in, basically, um, but 
the, the, the problem is, of course, a, a, a bit trickier than that because we thought in the, the 1970s and 60s that the human brain was generating sentences online on a rule-based uh, matter that you had the input and then you did drr, 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 and then out came the output. And now the AI also makes us think that there's at least partly a lot of the human brain is like that, that we just remember a tremendous amount of things, that we have a tremendous amount of things ready-made rather than generated online. Though it is still true that if you input nonsense into the native speaker, they will still come up with rule-based behavior. And I don't know, maybe, well, of course, maybe AI does. Uh, I don't know. So you have, nobody had difficulty in Hungarian, for example, when President Obama uh, was president and his name was pronounced the Hungarian way, Obama, very interesting why actually and why not Obama, but he was pronounced Obama. We all agreed that this was the educated Hungarian pronunciation, Obama. And uh, that the, the accusative or the suffix form would be Obama. That is to say that the final R would change to A, which has absolutely nothing to do with the English language or his original name or anything. It's a rule in Hungarian. But you might say, of course, that AI would also then very quickly look at 25 million Hungarian nouns which end in the letter A and notice how they behave and would, would then produce uh, his name accordingly. So it, it, it's, it's difficult. The most interesting still is the young child who makes mistakes and says things that he shouldn't you know, which, um, you know, I, like in English, a young child would say, I go to see my grandmother rather than I went to see my grandmother. That is to say, over-regularization. And that obviously proves that he's working uh, online and producing rule-based sentences. Hmm. Thank you. Yes, you're right. I think we have time for one more question. So this is the moment for those who have kept silence to, to raise their heads, raise their hands, raise their heads and raise their voices. So artificial intelligence is not intelligence at all, really, in the sense that we would mean, it. okay, it's artificial language production, artificial combination and so on. Anyone, this is really the last chance to, to do so. I would really, really want to encourage our younger audiences, members of the audience who are younger, to speak up at this point. If not, as I'm gathering here, then I would like to thank you everyone for attending today's second open lecture. So the second uh, open lecture that was taking place today. We will have one more open lecture next week on a Wednesday, the same time, five o'clock. It will also be taking place online. Then the guest will be Chaba Play, a noted psychologist, linguist himself, cognitive scientist. Uh, we will cover a similar uh, array of, of, of a variety of topics. Uh, and to, as today, the audience will have the chance to interact uh, with Professor Play uh, next week. Uh, so as for today, I would just like to thank you once again for everyone to, to, to attend this, uh, this open lecture and for the interesting questions. And I would like to specifically ask Professor Nad uh, ask, uh, sorry, thank Professor Nadezhdi for, for being available for today and for the very interesting uh, presentation and all the interesting things that he said. Thank you. The pleasure was mine.